Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Crohn's disease. Have you heard of it, Tracy? I have. Well, today you're going to know everything there is to know about Crohn's disease Very by good. the end of the program. <laughs> it's an inflammatory bowel disease, also referred to as an IBD. And Crohn's causes inflammation of the lining of your digestive tract, which can lead to abdominal pain, severe diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, even malnutrition. Inflammation caused by Crohn's can involve different areas of the digestive tract in different people, thereby different symptoms, different people. Sure. Crohn's disease can be both painful and debilitating and sometimes may lead to life-threatening complications. While there's no known cure for Crohn's disease, therapies can greatly reduce its signs and symptoms and even bring about long-term remission. Here to discuss Crohn's disease is Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist, Dr. Ed Loftus. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Loftus. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Yep, Dr. Loftus, nice to have you here. So Thanks. an inflammation of the bowel, and there are other inflammatory diseases of the bowel, but let's, we're going to concentrate on Crohn's. So tell us why that happens. The short answer is we still don't know. Um, there are a lot of hypotheses. What What's going on is that if you think about it, the gut is one of the major lines of defense for the body. Um, and it has to have a vigorous, healthy immune system. But if that immune system is too healthy or too vigorous, too overactive, um, it could result in inflammation. And it, the way I think of it simplistically, it's, it's as if the immune system forgets to turn itself off or it's lost the ability to distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. And so this persistent inflammation leads to abdominal pain, diarrhea, and if uncontrolled, can lead to narrowings of the bowel, obstruction, fistulas, abscess, etc. How common is it, or are we just hearing more about Crohn's disease? Well, it is becoming more common, and it seems as if as countries become more economically developed and sanitation improves, Ironically, we see more and more of these immune-mediated conditions. You may have heard something called the hygiene hypothesis in asthma. So kids that grow up on farms are less likely to get asthma than kids who grow up in the city. And we think the same thing might hold true for Crohn's. Maybe lack of exposure to certain antigens when you're a child means that your immune system isn't fine-tuned enough. And then later on in life, that might result in intestinal inflammation. The other theory, of course, is that there's something in our westernized diet that might be contributing to Crohn's disease. For example, in Asia, they didn't have Crohn's disease 30 years ago, and mm. now they're seeing it much more frequently than, the, than they used to. So this is not something that you're born with? You sort of implied that it, it would occur later on in life? Correct. The, 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 the average age of diagnosis is in the late 20s or early 30s. Mm. About 15% of people are diagnosed in the pediatric age range, typically after the age of 10, but occasionally at a younger age. However, you can see Crohn's being diagnosed even in people in their 70s and 80s. One of the things that I have learned doing this program with Dr. Shives over the years, in the last year and a half, I've heard so much about the microbiome and having a healthy gut and the importance of uh, reducing the amount of antibiotics that we take and that we ingest in our food. How does that whole piece play into Crohn's? It might play a lot. There are a few studies suggesting that early exposure to antibiotics might increase the risk of pediatric onset Crohn's disease. And there's weaker data to suggest that uh, use of antibiotics later in life might contribute to later onset Crohn's. But clearly the pediatric onset is, is more concerning. So what are they studying when it comes to the microbiome and some of these different gut issues? It's really, really complicated right now. So you can't even culture most of the bacteria in the colon using conventional microbiologic techniques. And so all of this is being done with D DNA fingerprinting techniques, and it requires incredible computer resources and money. So just to sample one person's microbiome right now is very time-consuming and, and expensive. And we're just in the infancy of this science. And I probably should say, because I'm not a doctor, does Crohn's count as a healthy gut type issue? Are those are these two different symptoms, situations we're talking about? No, there are some studies <laughs> to suggest that people with Crohn's disease have 
differences in their microbiome compared to people with a healthy gut. So there, there's some, one of the problems, though, is is it the chicken or the egg? In other words, is it the inflammation that changes the bacteria, or is it the change in bacteria that contributes to the inflammation? And so, again, just in our infancy of understanding some of these issues. You sort of suggested that this was a, an environmental or a dietary caused by the environment or, or, or something that we would eat, right? Uh, does it run in families then? There, there is a, a, definitely a genetic component. Um, Crohn's, in fact, was one of the um, pioneering diseases with all these this emphasis on genomics and genome-wide associated studies. There have actually been 200 different genetic mutations weekly associated with Crohn's disease, and it's estimated that the average person with Crohn's disease might have four or five of these mutations in these susceptibility genes, but it's not the classic Mendelian genetics where you know if what your parents' eye color is, you can predict your own eye color. It's very, very complex. The average genetic mutation is very common, and only 4% of the people with any of these genetic mutations actually have Crohn's. So there's a genetic susceptibility at the baseline, and then there's some environmental factor that triggers the whole process, and what that environmental factor might vary from person to person, and, and it's theorized that Crohn's disease isn't probably just one disease. It might be 50 different diseases, and they're expressing itself in a final common pathway. Wow, it all gets pretty complex. It's very, it? very complex. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it can occur basically at any age, you said. Normally, people are diagnosed in their late 20s or 30s. What do they come in with? What are their, what are their symptoms? So the most common presentation is developing inflammation in the bottom of the small intestine where it meets the large intestine, and that often results in diarrhea or abdominal discomfort, sometimes urgency, having to run to the bathroom quickly, uh, often fatigue. Um, if, however, pe some people present later on and they've already developed a stricture, so some people will present with severe abdominal pain with nausea and vomiting and actually develop a bowel obstruction. And uh, those people may require surgery. In fact, this, the, the diagnosis may not even be made until surgery is done for a bowel obstruction. Okay, so they go to the emergency room. A, a bowel obstruction is diagnosed usually on a CT or maybe even a, a plain X-ray of the abdomen. They go to surgery. They send a piece of the, the removed bowel to the uh, pathology lab, and they make the diagnosis. Correct. Is it pretty specific, pretty easy to diagnose under the microscope? It's a clinical diagnosis, which means the clinician has to put together multiple streams of information to make the diagnosis, taking into account the, the symptoms, the blood work, uh, w the appearance on the colonoscopy, and what the biopsies show. Um, and there is no one single finding that says, aha, you have Crohn's disease. It's, a, it's what we call a clinical diagnosis, so it's a syndrome. But basically, you're looking for chronic inflammation on the intestinal biopsies. So do you ever make the diagnosis without a biopsy? I am always very hesitant to do so because there are mimics of Crohn's disease. For example, intestinal tuberculosis or lymphoma, uh, certain infections, there's an, an infection called Yersinia, and these can mimic Crohn's disease. So we are always reluctant to make that diagnosis without intestinal tissue. And when you get the, the tissue, I assume that you can do that without opening the abdomen in most cases? Correct. Uh, usually by colonoscopy because you sample the lining of either the colon or the very, very bottom of the small intestine. All right, gastroenterologist Dr. Ed Loftus talking to us about Crohn's disease. We've learned about the symptoms, the diagnosis. When we come back, we'll talk about the treatment plus... Myth or matter of fact. Yeah. IBD can be caused by nerves and stress. Is that a myth or a fact? We'll find out when we return. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are back with gastroenterologist Dr. Ed Loftus, who's an expert in Crohn's disease. Well, we've got a myth or matter of fact for you, Dr. Loftus. Myth or matter of fact, IBD can be caused by nerves and stress. Is that a myth or a fact? It's mostly myth. Um, we don't think that stress per se can cause IBD, but in patients who have Crohn's disease, we think that stress could cause flares of mm. the condition. And so it, it, stress in and of itself won't cause the condition, but it can worsen the condition. 
What about some other other risk factors for Crohn's? Well, cigarette smoking uh, worsens really? Crohn's disease. Yes, uh, people who uh, smoke are more likely to get Crohn's disease, and in fact, their clinical course of Crohn's disease is worse. And so, the single most important lifestyle modification people can make if they have Crohn's disease is to stop smoking cigarettes. No kidding. Yes. So uh, we know that there are, we've learned a lot about Crohn's disease, but we know that there are other inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis. How do you tell the difference? And, and what is the difference between the different kind of, and how many kinds are there? Well, by definition, ulcerative colitis is localized to the colon. The type of inflammation in ulcerative colitis is slightly different because it's localized to the most superficial level of the bowel, whereas with Crohn's disease, it can be a full thickness inflammation. The entire bowel wall is thickened and inflamed, and, and that's one way to differentiate. The other way is that Crohn's is often patchy and segmental in nature, whereas ulcerative colitis tends to be continuous throughout the colon. So if you see a patient where the rectum looks normal, the sigmoid is inflamed, but higher up is normal than another point of inflammation, that is much more suggestive of Crohn's disease. Before we get to treatment, I just want to ask one other thing about risk factors. Are women more likely to have Crohn's disease than men? It's roughly 50-50 for, um, for, for Crohn's disease, but for ulcerative colitis, there's a slight male predominance. And what about, we know that with ulcerative colitis, it significantly increases your risk for colon cancer. Does Crohn's increase your risk for cancer of the bowel? It does. If you have colonic involvement with Crohn's disease, it probably increases your risk of colon cancer. If you have small intestinal involvement, there's a rare form of small bowel cancer. The absolute risk is fairly low, maybe 2 to 3% over a lifetime, but that's much, much higher than it would be in the general population. So you've said it's basically a, a clinical diagnosis. We've talked about the risk factors. We know you can get it at any age, but most commonly in the late 20s, early 30s, abdominal pain, fatigue, diarrhea. So once you've made that diagnosis, based on all the information you have, probably including a biopsy, what do you do to, for treatment? So the, the, the first thing we often treat is with steroids. We will give either prednisone or there's a type of uh, modified steroid that has fewer prednisone-related side effects called budesonide. And that will relieve some of the symptoms in the short term, but that's not an effective long-term treatment because of the side effects of steroids. And that's basically a super anti-inflammatory. You're doing that to reduce right. the inflammation. Right. And the, and, and the beauty of those is that they work rapidly. And so you can start making the patient feel better oftentimes within days or a week or two. But then how do you treat the Crohn's? What do we do long term? <laughs> right. So we have a series of medications called immunomodulators, and these include medications like azathioprine or mercaptopurine or methotrexate. We also have another class of drugs called the biologics, and biologics are basically synthetic proteins that mimic antibodies, and these are directed against specific inflammation targets. Uh, the, the most common example is a drug called infliximab, also known as Remicade, uh, but there are cousins of that, adalimumab, sertilizumab, and these are given either IV or subcutaneously, and this uh, is directly targeting one of the really, really important inflammatory molecules in Crohn's disease. But can it cure Crohn's, or do you just manage Crohn's? You manage Crohn's. There really is no cure, per se, for Crohn's. Um, th- Part of the challenge with Crohn's is that the clinical course over the years can be very variable, and some people have a mild course and other people have a more severe course. And so when we're making some of these treatment decisions, we're trying to prognosticate, is this a high-risk patient versus a low-risk patient? So the patient that gets Crohn's disease at a very young age and has lots of small bowel involvement, that's a high-risk patient, meaning they have a higher risk for going on to requiring surgery, and we want to treat them more aggressively. This summer, Dr. Shives and I uh, did some interviews about fecal transplants in helping patients who are experiencing a lot of these same symptoms. Is that an option for someone who suffers from a more severe case of Crohn's disease? It's a hot topic right now, and there are studies uh, looking into this, and there, there are some studies suggesting that fecal transplant plants might help people with ulcerative colitis. As of yet, we are, we're not convinced that fecal transplants help people with Crohn's disease, but people are looking into this. They want to try it? If they suffer so bad, I'm sure uh, they want to yes. try it. Uh, patients are always asking 
for fecal transplants. And, and part of it is a concern because the, the medications that we're talking about are very effective medications, but they carry some risks because they can suppress parts of the immune system and increase the risk of infections, and they might increase the risk slightly of certain types of malignancies like skin cancers or lymphomas. And so patients are always asking about alternative treatments or unconventional treatments, and the fecal transplants are unusually appealing to many people. Very so, unusually appealing. <laughs> yes. But the people who are having fecal transplant done, the success rate is unbelievable. Well, that that's for the people who are getting those recurrent Clostridium difficile yes. infections. And you're right, the success rate with those is over 90%. In the studies of ulcerative colitis, the success rates are much lower. Okay. And in some of the studies, it is significantly better than placebo, but in other studies, it's not. And so it's still, I think the jury is still out on how effective they are. But, you know, I can see how someone can be so frustrated that they do want to try everything, even surprisingly fecal transplant, because it affects your quality of life so much. And if it's something that you manage for the rest of your life, of course you want to find a way to make it better. Correct. I mean, I, I think um, I always go to the symptom of uh, if you're if you have urgency, meaning like you have 30 seconds of warning before you need to use the restroom, that really does that impacts your entire life. And uh, and uh, even though these are you know people don't like to talk about these diseases, they are quite disabling. And uh, we it just points to the fact that we need to do a better job at identifying effective treatments. But uh, I think you did say or did at least imply that you can pretty much control the symptoms of most patients with the medications that you have. Correct. Uh, but the medications are tricky. Another reason that they're tricky, not just because of side effects, is that they many of these treatments are proteins, and proteins are immunogenic, meaning that the body's own immune system can eventually recognize that they're not self and then you mm. develop an antibody reaction to the drug the drug levels go down and the drug stops working and so what we will often see is a patient we get them on a good drug they have a good run for two or three years but then they lose response to the drug then we have to do more testing and then uh, switch to a different agent does the whole of the bowel get inflamed or is it just a little bitty part could you cut out that little part or is the whole thing inflamed and that's not an option it's, it's variable. Uh, sometimes it is just a small part, and surgery um, is effective in the short term. The problem is, is that the recurrence rate after surgery, if, so if you were to do a colonoscopy 12 months after the person has a surgery, they're going to have inflammation present 80% of the time. And so the clinical recurrence rate is like 50-50 after five years. So surgery is good for temporizing, but again, it's not a cure. Well, certainly it is a is a puzzling disease, but it sounds like uh, you've got the uh, uh, medications that can pretty well control it in most individuals. Again, you said that it could affect any uh, age group, even patients in their 70s get uh, Crohn's Correct. disease. And the first uh, line of defense is to give them some uh, prednisone or some steroid to get it under control. And then longer term, you've got other medications to use. Surgery, sometimes an option. Correct, and and the other the other last frontier is diet. Uh, we you know there, there are lots of you search diet and Crohn's disease on the internet. You'll see a lot of funky diets out there. I think Most, that might be the first thing that you'd want to do. Right, and patients that's the first thing that patients ask right. about. But it's hard to prove that there is one diet that works okay. for everybody. And I give people some suggestions. You know, cut down on the sugar, cut back on the dairy, reduce red meat intake. <laughs> Uh, after that, you know, gluten-free, those sorts of things, it's really, we, we just don't have the data to support those things. All right, but you're learning more every day. Yes. Dr. Ed Loftus, gastroenterologist, GI specialist at the Mayo Clinic and an expert on Crohn's disease. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me.